Hello traders, this is Dollar Will. The views expressed in this video presentation are my opinions and not necessarily the opinions of guests and others sharing or reposting the video. The content is produced for educational and informational purposes. Do not regard any statement or statements in this video as a recommendation to buy or sell any investable instrument discussed. Investing comes with risk to loss of principal. Always conduct your own research and seek guidance from a professional investment advisor. I am not a professional investment advisor. With that out of the way, let's figure out how we're going to make some money, y'all. Uh, in this show, I'm going to give you a survey of what's going on with, of course, the dollar, gold, energy, because it heavily relates to what's going on with uh, the Dow and the S&P. Um, the S&P has had a little run-up, and the Dow has had a little run-up since the, since the, since the uh, decline. And everyone is saying that the bull market, not everyone, but, you know, the, the TV folks, the TV talking heads, they're saying the bull is back. I say bull crap. Okay, what we have here is the, uh, the, the, uh, the, it's called the diamond, but it's the uh, Dow Jones spider. I'm using my favorite, one of my favorite sites, uh, Bar Chart. It's free. That's one reason I like it. Uh, I like Trading View, but like I said, I had a two-year uh, contract, and I'm trying some different things before I re-up for another two years to try to see if I really need that. Because um, there are things in other programs that I like better. Um, but, I, but I do like trading view. Back to this. What we have here is the high on the 26th and the low on February the 9th. I'm looking at a daily view. Uh, six, six months is selected. I'm using my stochastic oscillator here at the bottom that I like. Um, if you prefer to use the RSI, it's nothing um, nothing wrong with that. The reason why I like the stochastic over the RSI is because you have this pair of lines and you get a crossover. Uh, when I use the RSI, some, what I'll do is I'll draw a trend line beneath the RSI and 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 uh, and let the RSI break the trend line. It'll still function the same, but I just like the uh, stochastic better. But what I've noticed in using the stochastic is when there is a reversal or what you think is a reversal, um, in that first decline, the RSI on the daily chart, this is true for the daily chart, it does not go back up to oversold status on the daily chart. And that's just come from experience. And we'll see Monday if, if, if it happens. But a lot of times it does not. I, I would say I've never seen it go all the way back up to the top on the daily chart after uh, what is a reversal. Usually what happens or what happens is a stochastic goes into the oversold territory and the, art, the oscillator comes up to around halfway in the neighborhood of, of 50 on the scale. And then it turns. Now, to get around that, or to not get faked out, I like to go into uh, intraday, usually around four hours, uh, three or four hours. But I'm I'm gonna go I'm gonna show you the difference between three and four hours. You have to put it in, in minutes on here. You have to go what's that 180? Uh, let me do 240 first to show you what four hours looks like. And uh, turn now down here. It gives you too close of a view. Once you do that, you have to zoom it out. Can you see here? Let me zoom in a little bit. I don't need to see all that information. Okay. Um, see the price high? 
You see the you see the uh, stochastic is in over bought territory. Fell the bottom. The peak is here. We rose all the way back up to uh, over bought. Now this is in the, on the four hour chart. And that's this is an example of what I'm talking about. The daily chart can can be a little skewed when the price reverses. The, the these oscillators don't re, don't always do a great job after a reversal. It takes a while for it to uh, adjust to the uh, to the new speed of the um, of 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 the reversal. The saying in the in the stock world is trading world is prices take the how's this go takes takes the escalator up. And the elevator down. Prices fall much faster than they rise. Now, psychologically, that does a job on us if we're not watching charts, because we think that because something has been rising, you know, for the last six months, that we can afford to walk away and check on it two, every two or three months. It can wipe out prices can fall fast enough to wipe out six months in like two weeks, three weeks, and definitely inside of a month. So, you know, all that to say is you really have to watch. And and because of that speed, that rate of change in the speed of the descent, it takes a while for the oscillator on the daily chart to catch up uh, to that change. Okay, now let me go back to the now if we see here on the uh, 240, it has not um, crossed over. Now I'm going to 100, 180 minutes. That's three hours on this chart. I think it did cross over, but I don't. I don't. I don't put uh, make my decision just because you know exactly because this thing crossed over. But it's pretty close to the price. This is the peak. And it crossed over. Um, I guess why use a four-hour um, oscillator when a three-hour would do the job? Okay, so I would put a trend line here. Um, use this moving average to, to confirm. Um, but I feel safe just trading this oscillator. I'm looking at the fact that we went from over. We were overbought. Went to oversold, oh here's the low, went back to overbought. What I want to see is when we get back to oversold, will we take out this low? That's what I want to see. Now as far as Fibonacci goes, let's see. What happened was... Sixty-one percent line. We barely peaked uh, over it, so we came back. We retraced in the neighborhood of uh, a Fibonacci resistance. Now, this stuff does not have to be exact. And when we're making these calls, we're looking for a, a, co a combination of things. Now, remember from my other video. Um, January 13th. If you're watching this video for the first time, go on my page and look at my call on, on January 13th, Dow Jones Industrial Average, where I do a 100-year perspective on it with uh, chart information, and I show an Elliott Wave count where, um, according to my thesis, I like working from a thesis, uh, this peak right here is wave 3. On that more than 100 year chart about you know, a bit of information so I'm working within my thesis now I could be wrong but until I'm proven wrong I'm going with this I'm going with this now there's some other things that's, that support the idea that we're going down now again we're looking at the Dow Jones industrial average now that is industrials that's companies that's metals that's oil um, things that big 
corporations need to make uh, big manufacturers, industrial manufacturers, okay? They need a lot of energy. They need a lot of raw materials, okay? What we have, what I'm trying to bring up now, if my page will draw it faster, I do not know what the deal is. We have a steel and aluminum glut. Uh, steel comes from iron ore. Um, associated with making steel is, uh, I believe that's metallurgical coal. They take this particular type of coal and put it in a furnace to, to make the steel. But that coal is something about that coal, properties of that coal which make it uh, ideal for steel. Now, we have a glut of all this stuff. We got a glut on uh, steel, and we also have uh, a glut on oil. I'll get to that. Now, this glut on st uh, steel came out it had been, been it was discussed for a while, but a, re a recent action for you fundamental traders that think that you know the news creates the price movement. It doesn't, but it's but they it's always something released either by a company or the government right around a critical point where oil or steel or gold was going to fall anyway. And then they'll issue a report to say, well, that's why it fell. Okay. So this here is um, a report saying that there is, let's see. Uh, today, Secretary Wilbur Ross released reports on the U.S. Department of Commerce's investigation into the impact on our nationals, national security from imports of steel mill products and from imports of wrought and unwrought aluminum. These investigations were carried out under Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, as amended. I don't really care what that act is. The reason why I'm reading this is to let you know, or show an example of how we make agreements long in advance. C countries make long-term agreements. And Fortune 500 companies service those agreements. So they pretty much have guaranteed profits because one country will make an agreement with another to provide a particular item. So you don't have to market. You already know what who the customer is for your product. And some of these companies are traded on the uh, stock market and many of them are in the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the uh, and are among the S and P 500, the 500 largest companies in this country. Right. So it really doesn't matter what what this deal is with this investigation, but I'm just make wanted uh, to point out a few things in this where you can kind of get a sense of how macroeconomic issues can affect price, okay? Long stuff that's like long been in the works. Not 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 the president or somebody making a an announcement or earnings report just in one day. You know, a lot of these things these things have been in motion for a very long time. Oil has been falling since like two thousand and eight. Steel has been full falling since two thousand and eight. Uh gold has been falling since twenty eleven. So you know, this is not a secret to anybody. Okay. Key findings of the Steel Report. The United States is the world's largest, I'm not going to read all of this, is the world's largest importer of steel. Our reports are nearly, our imports are nearly four times our exports. Why would we do that? Because it's cheaper. It's not that we don't have it. It's just cheaper to buy from someone else than to pay you to do it, <laughs> you know. And 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 it's you know it's a part of trade for other things. It gets political, okay. 
six basic oxygen furnaces, furnaces and four electric furnaces have closed since 2000 and employment has dropped by 35% since 1988. We know that because Trump made a, made a big issue out of rallying those folks. Okay. World steelmaking capacity is 2.4 billion metric tons, up 127% from 2000. So in the same period of time that we had uh, our employment drop by 35%, the world increased its capacity by 127%. Wow, the recent global excess capacity is 700 million tons, almost seven times the annual total of U.S. steel consumption. Wait a minute. The United States is the largest importer of steel. We're the largest importer of steel in the world. And the global excess capacity is seven times the annual total of U.S. steel consumption. <laughs> so if you're making steel, you can't give it away. China is by far the largest producer and exporter of steel. And the largest source of excess steel capacity. Their excess capacity alone exceeds the total U.S. steel making capacity. Wow. Wow. On an average month, China produces nearly as much steel as the U.S. does in a year. I think you get the point. Well, well wait a minute. As of February 15th, here's the environmental aspect. As of February 15th, the U.S. had 169 anti-dumping and counter uh, countervailing duty orders in place on steel, of which 29 are against China, and these are 20, and there are 25 ongoing investigations. Now that's important because that tells you this is a common thing. You'll notice it with oil. See, we, I learned so much once I started. It's once I started trading, uh, make road. Uh, Issues like oil and gold versus the dollar because you interpret the news you watch on television differently because this dumping thing whenever there's an oversupply of something Mysterious stuff starts happening like when there's an oversupply of oil Suddenly we get a dang on oil spill. We never get no oil spill when 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 oil is like I'm not gonna say never but most recently, it seems that we don't get or any 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 uh, uh, mishaps with oil when oil is real expensive. When you have uh, something that's over an oversupply, you have to get rid of that supply. If you're the producer of that thing, you have to get rid of that excess supply so that you can increase prices. Okay, so here here we are in a steel glut, and people are dumping it. China, of course, China would be the one trying to dump it because they're the producers of it. So, it's putting stuff in perspective. Now, here's the good stuff, too. So, what else? On one hand, you have the steel producers dumping it. On another hand, you have America saying, don't send us no more. <laughs> we don't want any more. Now, remember, you have a trade agreement. I'm sure it stipulates that you're going to buy so much. The United States is saying, no, don't, don't send us no more. So, here we go. A global tariff of at least 24% on all steel imports from all companies. Country, let's go. Secretary Ross has recommended to the president that he consider the following alternative remedies to address the problem of steel imports. A global tariff on at least 24% on all steel imports from all countries. A tariff of at least 53% on all steel imports from 12 countries, Brazil, China, Costa Rica, Egypt, India, Malaysia, Republic of Korea, 
Russia, South Africa, Thailand, Turkey, and Vietnam. Has anybody left with a quota byproduct on steel imports from all other countries equal to 100% of their 2017 exports to the United States? Or a quota or a quota on all steel products from all countries equal to 63% of each country's 2017 exports to the United States. Wow. Each of these remedies is intended to increase domestic steel production from its present 73% of capacity to approximately an 80% operating rate. I don't believe it. I think they just don't want to. I think we have a glut of it. We have too much of it. We're not going to put people to work making, at least not at this moment. They just don't want to buy anymore. The minimum rate needed for the long-term viability of the industry. I mean, um, I'm sorry. It was present to approximately 80% operating rate. The minimum rate needed for the long-term viability of the industry. Okay. The, min hmm. the minimum rate needed for the long-term viability of the industry. Okay, so that means, if I'm reading that right, there's a certain amount of production we got to maintain just to keep the industry going, just to keep people employed. Each remedy, if, I, if anybody has a different interpretation of what I'm reading, put it in the comments. Each remedy applies measures to all countries and all steel products to prevent circum uh, to prevent circumvention. All right. Okay, I'm not going to get into aluminum. You get the point. We have a glut, and this is macro stuff. Okay, um, and we're at the top of wave three. Now you see how these things kind of relate, ripple into the stock market. All right. Moving on. Our Celerometal, I guess I'm pronouncing that correctly. This is the largest steel company by market cap in the United States. And this peak was in 2008 like I said it's been falling this whole time and we still have a glut and I think this price here I think we're still going down I think we're going to continue to go down okay we made a new low I'm looking on the monthly chart and you know the rule of an uptrend is a higher high and a higher low well, we made a new low. I don't need to draw a trend line or anything. I can see that the vibe, the rule of the of, of, of continuing trend uh, has been broken. There's no higher uh, high. Now, it could be a pullback like here. We'll see. I doubt it. I think we go lower. Now, this is February 2016. It's been rising since then to now. Now, a rise in energy and metals puts downward pressure on the dollar. The dollar still has not turned north. Um, at least the dollar franc, let me put it that way. If, if we measure it against the, 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 the uh, franc, it hasn't. Um, but on some other uh, uh, um, measurements, it's it's stronger. Let's see, relatively speaking, it's really nothing more to say about that. Let me move on. Yes, so then we get to the good stuff. Gold. What we have here is the gold started falling in 2011. The bottom was in uh, November 30th, 2015, 2015. So that's two years and two months ago. Uh, and, no, and on November 30th, 2015, for seven months, gold rose. It made a peak in July of 2016. Ever since then, we've been making this triangle 
but we've never made a new high. So we've been trading for almost two, let's see, since this peak right here, a year and a half. Let's say a year and a half. Okay, this move took seven months. But since this high, a year and a half later, we still trading inside the band from this low to this high for seven, I mean, for a year and a half. This is incredibly frustrating. Now, what you have here is an ascending triangle. I'm going to go to my favorite site, see what that is. My favorites, uh, aside from bar charts, my second favorite site, or at least for definitions, my favorite site is Investopedia. When I was learning how to um, read charts, so even when I was learning fundamental analysis, I would sit down with a pen and paper and write down words that people said on TV that I, I didn't understand what they meant. I would uh, Google it, and, and Google would consistently bring me to this page, Investopedia. So I say, why don't I just go here directly? All right. So this one is triangles. Um, we're going to talk about ascending triangles. show you this a little bit. I'm going to skip on through it pretty fast. My computer has got, like, too much stuff going on. All right. The triangle can be a continuation or a reversal pattern, but it's usually um, a continuation, meaning that that decline that started in 2011, uh, that downward trend will continue. All right, I just want to. I'm. I want to go faster. The different types of triangles. The symmetrical triangle is uh, the both are uh, sloping, sloping down and sloping up towards each other. Symmetrical triangles are created when both trend lines are moving towards each other. Okay. An ascending triangle occurs when the lower trend line is rising while the upper trend line is horizontal. It's not exactly. It doesn't have, it doesn't have to be exactly horizontal. It can be slightly, a little, slightly uh, slope, essentially horizontal. This shows that swing loads are rising, but the rallies are stopping near the same resistance level. That is true. And on another previous video, I went to the 2011 peak of uh, gold. I went to the 2011 peak, and I bought, uh, I, I did my retrace from the low. And this point right here is a 38% retrace. That's one of those key areas on the uh, Fibonacci uh, extension tool and we can't break above that 38% uh, retrace so far but let's go back and see what it says an ascending triangle occurs when the lower trend line is rising while the upper trend line is horizontal uh, or essentially horizontal as I'm adding this shows the swing lows are rising but the rallies are stopping near the same resistance level that's what's happening look what happens kind of flat at the top this is the ascending part it goes down it continues in the direction of the trend now let's say this was 2011 for gold and this is that low in 20 late 2015 I showed you on that chart we have an ascending triangle I believe we're gonna break I think that we're gonna follow the rule of ascending triangle what well what happens most of the time Officially, they say it could happen either way, but they say it usually breaks to the downside. It's not 50-50. It's well more than, greater than 50-50 that it, uh, it's a continuation pattern. A, descend, a descending triangle is when the upper trend line is sloped down while the bottom trend line is horizontal. We don't have that right here. But it shows you that the uh, basically the horizontal part holds okay the breakout is in a direction of the slope whether it's an ascending or descending that's the part of the structure that gives way okay so that's all I want to say on that okay this we're gonna come back to but go to this page Investopedia um, triangles I will be talking about a lot um, we're going to talk about, there's a wedge pattern forming for the dollar. That might be good to read. Okay.
and I'm not going to get into this much, but this is the dollar. Other than to say, dollar that's the dollar versus the Swiss franc. That's called the wedge pattern. Examples of wedges look similar, doesn't it, to what we saw. Now, with wedge patterns, it's a downward wedge. It breaks out to the upside. That's the way they go. If the wedge is pointing up, it breaks out to the downside. That's the way they go. Okay, I'll let you read that. And here we are, looking at the dollar, that downward wedge, added two lines here, you know, just to emphasize the point of the wedge. So we should get a breakout to the upside soon. Uh, stay on the lookout for that. Moving right on. Oilprice.com and IEA warns of new oil glut. That's the International Energy Agency. It says the global oil market could slip into deeper oversupply. That's deeper oversupply, meaning that we're already in an oversupply. So we got an oversupply in steel, no oversupply in oil. Okay, the global oil market could slip into deeper oil supply on the back of non-OPEC production growth led by the United States, International Energy Agency said in its latest oil market report. Now, this article I downloaded, I found it today, and it said, um, this was from February the 13th, so this is very pretty recent information. The main factor, the IEA said, is U.S. oil production in just three months to November. Crude output increased by a colossal 846, whatever that is, KB, whatever that is. And will soon overtake that of Saudi Arabia by the, by the end of this year. It might also overtake Russia to become the global leader. Now, that's a lot. The significance of it is an oversupply. Um, in order to, to sell something that's uh, an oversupply, you have to mark the price down. You see that every time you go in the store, you see stuff in the cutout bin or the discount rack. You know, it's, it's it, they have to give you some incentive to buy it. Commenting on the recent reversal in, in oil prices, the authority attributed it to profit-taking and a market correction spanning all industries adding that oil's fundamentals supported a decline in prices. I'll say that again for you fundamental uh, researchers there. Adding that oil's fundamentals supported a decline in prices. So this agency is saying that the price of oil is too high. So if you have steel falling, you have oil falling, you have gold uh, in a ascending triangle, which is a prescription for a decline, then all of that downward pressure in, in those uh, in, in energy and metal is going to uh, be supportive of a dollar rise. And with energy and oil being um, prominent in the Dow, I can't see how the Dow is going to continue to rise. See, that's it for this. Let's move on to see what Exxon is doing in light of what we just read. Huge candlestick here. I think I want to change this to a candlestick if I can remember. Remember how to do it on this chart. I haven't changed that. I think it's over here. Nope. Uh, let's try.
So that's a 20 year view. Let me go down to a That's a pretty ugly decline. Now this is Exxon. Exxon is the largest energy company on earth. They are the second largest company, I believe, by market cap in the United States. And this little space here, we're looking at a, uh, uh, this is intraday. Let me move it to daily. This is a daily chart of Exxon. And this space here is called a gap. Now that's very aggressive when the price gaps and leaves a hole. And especially when it doesn't rise and fill the gap. So this is large amount of sale in a short amount of time. And for this to be the largest energy company in the world, it doesn't drop um, 20 points. I guess that would be... 88, uh, the high would be 89, 89 down to 73, so it's like 26 points, that's, that's a lot from the 29th of January to the 2nd of uh, February. So that's about essentially two weeks. It's probably 10 trading days in there. In two weeks, that's huge. So coming off of that Inter International Energy Agency report, of course the report came out on the 13th, which was after all this happened. <laughs> they told you what we could figure out already by the chart, which is the price was coming down. They said the fundamentals supported uh, this decline. And what does that mean? That means it's a glut or sales are, 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 uh, don't support higher prices. So there you have it. Expect to see the dollar respond by going higher. I don't see the Dow turning around. This uh, pullback what they're calling a rally is normal part of the oscillation of a downtrend and I think we continue to go down from here that's all I got like the video comment and subscribe beside the subscribe button you'll see a, a an alarm hit that alarm the nature of the information that I'm providing to you is such that you need to be alerted when I post a video. Now, one other crucial information. Wow, I almost forgot this. I can't, can't forget this. Got to cover this. Let me, let me go back to this view. Still Exxon. This is a support line. It started in July 2002. It's running till now. We fell. We hit it. We bounced up. I'm sorry. No, we didn't bounce up. We fell to it. We rose. We fell to it just now on February the 9th. Bounced up slightly. We're going to go through it. When we violate this trend line, it's going to make big news. This trend line has lasted for 16 years. That's a major, major issue when you break a, a support trend line that's been running for 16 years. For you volume watchers, there your, there's your volume spike there. Zoom in a little bit. We're looking at uh, a monthly chart. Now that's a pretty big red candle. This, the length of this red candlestick is long, it's probably longer than, I believe it's longer than every candlestick you see. Maybe here, maybe here. Ah, no, this one's longer. 
So we haven't had a, probably hadn't had a month like this in Exxon in approaching 20 years. And I didn't hear about it in the news, did you? I bet you hear about it if it breaks this trend line. Not if, when it breaks this trend line. And that should happen this week. And when it breaks this trend line, they're going to tell you that's why the Dow is falling. But the Dow is falling because of lots of selling pressure, as we already talked about uh, gold and steel, a lot of the industrials. But stay tuned. Again, like, comment, subscribe, and hit the hit the alert. Later today, I sh I hope to do a video that's uh, focused on the cryptocurrencies. I'm gonna take a look at Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, because this kind of movement in the dollar should have an impact on those uh, instruments. So we'll take a look and see what we can glean as to what might happen on Monday in an environment where the dollar should absolutely be stronger. I'm out.